Hi booktube and welcome to my Friday Reads which is three books I've finished and three I've started. So we have The Three Body Problem, Six Yun Li, Liu, a Chinese author. This is the first in a trilogy of science fiction. Uh, Man in the Holocene by Max Frisch and non-fiction Desert Divers by Sven Lindqvist, Swedish. So I'm going to start with the, uh, the three body problem, Six Yun Liu, Liu, sorry, it's really struggling with that name. And what a mixed reading experience this was. I mean, you could almost plot my engagement with it on a sort of a sine wave graph. It's sort of extraordinary ups and downs I felt while reading this. So it starts off brilliantly with a description of sort of uh, Maoist China, the Cultural Revolution, and there's the scene opening where it's a sort of self-denunciation session of, of, you know, enemies of the state. Uh, and it's, you know, the, all these young revolutionary guards out of the, the, the universities and they've abandoned their courses and, you know, they're going on this, this programme of, you know, ensuring ideological purity throughout the country. And it's a brilliantly written scene, you know, it almost has nothing to do with science fiction. It's, you know, it's a sort of piece of historical, evoking a historical incident. Um, and it sets in motion everything that follows. And interestingly for me, I was always trying to wonder, is this just a straight sci-fi book or is a lot of this um, sort of a parable of, of events in China? So, for example, when they're talking about sort of space travel and the ability to travel, uh, one of the scientists says, the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. And I'm pretty sure that's an echo of Mao's words about the, the long march. So I was never quite sure, uh, you know, how much this book is about China and how much it is straight science fiction. When you read uh, the author's note in the back, you get the sense that he's more, as a child, he was certainly fascinated by science and science fiction. And he, he seems to be leaning more towards that than sort of political parable, which is fine, but I was just slightly sort of bemused. I wasn't sure how it was going to go. Anyway, so... After we had the, you know, the, the Cultural Revolution scene, we, you know, we jump forward in time to sort of the next generation. And there's a, you know, this um, nanotechnologist starts having these sort of, they're not visions. He, everywhere he goes, he sees this countdown clock ticking. And, you know, obviously that's sort of quite perturbing, really. He doesn't know what it represents. No one else can seem to see it. And through a chain of events that I won't delve into, uh, he ends up going online to play this very exclusive game called The Three Pro Body Problem, the title of the book. And it is a series of um, scenarios of a world which has three suns rather than the single sun that we have of our own. And because of the different orbits and the closeness of the suns or the distance of the suns to, to that planet, it creates a very unstable climate system of severe heat and, and perishing cold. Uh, and they only have periodic bouts of what's called stability, climate stability, where they can develop, but they can only develop their society in those sort of windows. The rest of the time, when it's sort of too serially hot, they are able to dehydrate themselves and sort of go into sort of cold storage or hibernation. Where it's not actually, it's more desiccated rather than a cold storage thing. But this is where I had the problem with the book, because... It is a game, and although there's lots of really interesting ideas, and in a way it echoed um, Olaf Stapleford's The Last Man, uh, First and Last Man, sorry, in, the, in this sort of brilliant inventiveness about development of societies and almost like terraforming and all these different sort of responses as technology increases and, and the biology of, of, of the, the beings, I mean, they're not humans, increases. The, the, the ideas on show there were tremendous, but he is describing a game, an online game. And to me, that's the equivalent of all this e-gaming where, you know, the, lots and lots of people tune in online to watch other people playing PlayStation games. And it absolutely baffles me. You know, I, I couldn't imagine anything worse than watching other people playing animated games, be it, you know, an animated football game or an animated shoot -em up game. It's just utterly baffling to me and I found that was a problem because although there are all these interesting ideas I knew it was a game and I knew there were stages and levels and you know I, I kind of 
tuned out really at that. But when that was over and it was sort of revealed where that led into, and I'm not I'm not going to talk about it really because of their spoiler, you know, it would be spoilers. Um, as again, again, I can only say that the level of inventiveness, the thought on show here, of thinking all these wonderful scenarios, which do have, you know, reflect on us as human beings and our existence and life and scale in the cosmos and all these sorts of things. And, you know, I'm a lay person. I, I don't have, you know, above high school qualification in sciences. Uh, but I can understand all, you know, or get enough out of all the different things that are thrown at this book be it quantum physics, be it cos you know, phys uh, the physics of the, of the cosmos, gravitational waves, uh, nanotechnology, all of this sort of thing. It was very, very accessible. And I have to commend it for that because, you know, these are all very, very modern theories and modern technologies, but they didn't leave me baffled. So that's all I'm going to say about it, really. I give this book four. I would have given it three because of that, you know, long sections of this game descriptions of this game playing but there are so many good ideas on the show and the inventiveness are so impressive that that definitely raises it back to a fourth now interestingly as i say it's part of a trilogy am i going to read books two and three i don't know at this stage i need to let this book sit with me now for quite a while and decide whether i want to plow on with it now i think books two and three take place quite removed from here in terms of quite a long time in the future. So hopefully there wouldn't be that game playing, you know, thing in it. But, you know, there's a seven page preview of the first chapter of the next book, and it's really heavy handedly written. And although the second book has a different translator to books one and three, it's not down to the translation because I can't imagine that the translator has not done anything but, you know, reasonable justice to the way it's written. It just seems compared, compared with the rest of this, I, so I don't know. I will say that at times there there is a lot of exposition, there's a lot of info dump, there's a lot of explaining scientific theories in the guise of characters talking to each other or being interrogated or whatever. So at times the characters recede back and you're really getting the information and stuff. But again, you know, there's enough in it, uh, as I say, that warranted four, four stars. OK, on to Man in the Holocene by Max Frisch. Now, Max Frisch is the husband of uh, Ingeborg Bachmann, whose book Melina I read last month. Yeah, last month, and I reviewed. Um, so that Melina was the first in my uh, reading more German lit in 2020, and this is my second. Uh, Frisch himself was Swiss, but wrote in German. I'd never really come across his, you know, even in sort of passing reference. I think I mentioned in one of my non-review videos that when I thought of the name Max Frisch, for some reason, I thought he was a German expressionist painter, not a Swiss novelist. But anyway, so the Holocene period is the current sort of geological period that we are in. So it's kind of modern man or contemporary man. And this is set in uh, Alpine, Switzerland, in a village of the lower reaches, so it's not high up in the mountains, but it is definitely rural. And a 74-year-old man uh, is in the village, and he is beginning to lose his memory. Is it Alzheimer's, dementia, that kind of thing? And the village itself has, has suffered, or the whole area, has suffered non-stop rain. And there's, you know, transport is impossible, the mail van can't, can't travel, uh, so village life is completely disrupted and there's a great fear that actually part of the mountain will, will just crumble and fall and destroy the village or other villages around. So there's this sense of, of decay and threat. But it's, you know, what, what this book is, I enjoyed so much about it. It's about the scale of time, history, the earth, because... Because he is losing his memory, he's trying to sort of establish uh, facts that he can remember. So he cut, initially he copies out of an his set of encyclopedias, and then gradually he realises, as you forget that, I'll just cut them out. So he's sort of ruining these books. And he's sticking them all over his wall, like you would see in that movie Memento. Um, but they're not things that he's... If they're things that he's forgotten, that he once knew, they are facts. There's nothing really personal to him. And there's things about the dinosaurs. There's things about the different nature of, of the different 
peerage, you know, the Cretaceous, the Jurassic, etc., uh, etc. Et There's things about, uh, you know, Iron Age tribes. Um, and this is all the sort of stuff that he's cutting out because what he's doing, whether consciously or not, he is placing himself Holocene man in a, in a continuum of the history of the world and beyond that, the history of the cosmos, of the universe, including, you know, in the case of our world, the, the death of the dinosaurs and stuff. And what it's doing is it's, it shows just how small scale, tiny and insignificant mankind is, you know. Our period will be whatever it is, however long we last for on Earth. Uh, but, you know, the greater scheme of things, we are tiny and irrelevant. And, you know, I thought this book did, did that really, really well. And not only is, is the whole species tiny and irrelevant, but his personal battle to sustain and survive you know, with his sort of diminishing memory and his slow march towards death, we, we presume. Um, I just thought all oh, that was, you know, really well done. It's a very short novel. It's about 120 pages, you know, 110. So it's done with supreme economy, but it really gets you thinking. It really prompts uh, sort of, you know, contemplation about our place in the scheme of things. And I just, I just really enjoyed that. So I would definitely pick up another Max Frisch. I gave this four stars. Uh, no, 4.5 stars, I think, actually. And finally, on to some non-fiction. So this is one of the books that um, Mitchell sent me. And it's a book about desert romanticism and sort of very much lancing that. So uh, Sven Lindfist himself has travelled through the desert and gives us a little inkling onto his own impressions. But he's really, you know, this is travelogue come uh, literary criticism because what he's doing is he's tracing the paths of various uh, literary romantics who wrote about the desert. Most of them are French, but not all of them. So we get Gide's book, The Immoralist. And then we get three or four other writers who I've never heard of, but absolutely fascinating, both in their, their strange sort of psyches and also in their relationship to... Um, to the desert. So one is Isabel Eberhard, uh, who uh, I ought to say, sorry, that the desert he's talking about, and he's travelling in, is the Sahara Desert. And he starts off uh, in the Western Sahara, which is sort of basically uh, in a state of, of war between the Moroccans who oversee and administer it and the Western Saharans themselves, who basically want independence and are currently all sort of rounded up in camps. And it was very good uh, on that for me because it wasn't a history of an area that I particularly knew about and, and it filled me in very, very economically and, and well on that. Uh, and then the rest of the book as he travels into Algeria and of course that's much more about the sort of direct French colonialism uh, over Algeria. So so these, these this rum set of romantic writers and characters, Isabel Eberhardt, uh, who was French, who was a woman um, who was very, you know, turn of the century, turn of the 20th century, so late 1800s, early 1900s. She died at age 27, and she died because she was a woman of excess. She wanted to experience everything that was possible to experience. She was an absolute, absolute sensualist, but not like um, J.K. Huisman's character in Against Nature, who just sits in his room, you know, experiencing on an aesthetic level, this woman threw herself body and soul into everything. Her life was an extended suicide. With increasing regularity, she took refuge in drugs, alcohol, and a brutal, self-destructive, indiscriminate sexuality. She suffered from innumerable illnesses, among them malaria and probably syphilis. But she was a writer. She did produce writing, and her writing, in a way, has outlasted uh, everyone else mentioned this work, other than Gide, obviously. Um, she was a fascinating character, you know, she spent a lot of time, you know, quite manly and dressing up as a man and, and stuff, but also a woman alone, although she did marry uh, an Algerian, uh, a woman alone in, in an Arabic culture, you know, sort of no fear whatsoever. And then we have another character called Lottie, who basically made it big with his first book, which was set, you know, in a, in a sort of fantasised version of the desert. And I think from memory, he's, he'd never even visited there. It's all came out of his head. So because he was, you know, quite well off on the sales of his books, he was able to buy this house and he turned it into an extraordinary sort of themed house where there was an Arabic room, a Turkish room, a museum of his childhood, a Gothic room, 
uh, Chamber of Mummies, a mosque, um, Terrace of the Bees, um, a Renaissance room, etc. You know, Chinese room, etc. So, all, you know, but this architecture very much represented his fancy life because he would dress up and inhabit these rooms. Sometimes he would dress up as a male, sometimes he would dress up as a female, but he would live out each of these fantasies in, in, in the scenario in each of the rooms that he built. He was a very, very strange character and, and you know, I was absolutely fascinated to read him. But the, 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 the chapter that really got to me was uh, to Laghoat, which is a place in Algeria. And the writer there is Eugène Fromentin, again French, and again not someone I've ever heard of. And Linda Fiss is talking about how Fromentin, uh, when he visited Laguat, found the locals very surly, or the character of his book, I, you know, I don't know if it was fiction or non-fiction, but he found the local hours very surly, very hostile. And Linda Fiss is, is commenting, well, when I've gone there, they're the absolute opposite, they're the typical you know, hos um, hospitable, generous Arab hosts. So, he, you know, uh, Lindquist does a bit more digging into Fromentin and finds some journal entries where Lament uh, Fromentin happened to be there after the French had, had sort of uh, invaded the, the, the village or the small town, whatever it is. Now, the Sahara is so big, you know, it's ungovernable in one sense in that you can't, you can't put sort of um, battalions to guard it on a permanent basis. So the French had to decide where they were going to leave troops behind and where they were going to, you know, subdue the locals but then move on. And for whatever reason, they decided they were going to stay in Lagoat. But the problem was that they, you know, They'd thrown the bodies of the, of the dead Arabs that they subdued there. They'd thrown them into all the local wells, so they'd poisoned the water. But once they decide they're going to stay, <laughs> they've got to do something about that. So they send the locals down the wells, you know, which are clogged of their dead, you know, kin, dead animals, you know, really, really unpleasant. And as, you know, as Fromentin sort of says, is it any wonder that they hate us? And yet in his fiction... He's changed the narrative to just saying they're hostile and surly. He doesn't give any context as to what lies behind that. And I, I found that absolutely fascinating. You know, that sort of uh, rewriting of history in fiction. And then the final thing is the final chapter, which has a, an ecological bent, an environmental bent. So this book was written 20 years ago, or published 20 years ago. Uh, and yet it's, you know, right on message about ecology because... In the desert, the villages survive on their wells. And there was a sort of profession which was very dangerous but very high status called the well divers, who were people who had to go and sort of unblock and keep clean all these wells. But And, and Lindquist is talking to, to a retired well diver in the last chapter. And the well diver points out that it's a dying profession because wells are being replaced by basically sort of blasted you know, the water equivalent of fracking, basically. Deep bore. They are wells, but they're sort of, they're blown up by dynamite to, to access them. And as he says, the natural wells have been formed over, you know, hundreds of thousands of years of water travelling underground to fill these wells, and they are sustainable. They are self-renewing. They have been over all these hundreds of thousands of, thousands of years. The problem with this sort of fracking approach is that they're not self-renewing at all, and they're also drawing off water from the wells. You know, they're, they're interrupting the passage of the water down from the Atlas Mountains or wherever they're coming from, down underground, before they get to the wells. You know, they're disturbed and drawn, on, drawn off by these, these deep bull things. So what a stupendous book this is. Um, you know, five stars. And a brief note on what I'm currently reading. Uh, I seem to have got myself embroiled in three books, which I wasn't intending to do. So I'm on page 66 out of 140, is it? Oh no, 120, of uh, why I've not written any of my books by Marcel Benabou, French writer, member of the Aleppo movement in the 60s. Uh, when Mitchell sent this to me, I, mis I misunderstood what he was saying. I thought this was non-fiction, but it isn't. It's fiction. It's a novel. Uh, and why I've not written any of my books, when, when I read that title first, I thought it meant, oh, he's just basically, what he means is he's plagiarised them. You know, they're not his 
books to write. He sort of cobbled them together from other people's. But no, it's not that. It's, or at least as far as I've got, it's why he hasn't been able to put pen to paper and actually execute any of the teeming number of ideas for books he has in his head. So it's, it's you know, it's quite gentle, self-effacing satire about the, the nature of, and the impossibility of writing. Um, I will talk about what my reactions are once I finish them. And I started this today, Body Tourist by Jane Rogers, who's a British writer I've not heard of before. I think this is a, a slightly more sort of mass market, conventional novel than I'm used to reading. But the reason I'm reading it is because of its subject matter. Because the body tourists are people who have died, but been, they've had their, their memories digitally preserved um, in a sort of digital version of cryonic freezing. And uh, a guy has invented a technology whereby uh, living young people will rent out their bodies for two weeks, which is the maximum length of time that these memories can be inserted into them before they die for a final time and these people get their bodies back. And there is such a sort of di divergence between rich and poor in the London that's portrayed in here in 2045 that there are plenty of people willing to take the £10,000, which doesn't sound very much, but in this economy is a lot for the people at the bottom of the scale, uh, to rent out their bodies effectively for two weeks. And I'm only on page 60, uh, so I've got nothing really to say about it, um, other than the reason I picked up in the first place was because my current work in progress, which I'm just about to finish, also deals with post-death afterlife through technology. So I just wanted to see what this author's approach was. And finally, this came through my letterbox while I was at work today. This is Weather by Jenny O'Phil, which I pre-ordered last year. And I'm probably going to drop this for this. I'm going to read this because Jenny O'Phil wrote The Palm to Speculation, which I read last year and really enjoyed. It's quite epigrammatic, so I'm interested to see if it's more of the same with this or if, she did, if she's doing something different. And um, so I will probably start this tonight, actually. It's quite short and it's very spaced out on the page. It's about 200 pages. So I would say I could easily knock this off over the weekend and revert to that on my commute on Monday. But I do have James Joyce's Ulysses to read this weekend. Uh, I'm going to shoot a video on my initial impressions and reactions to uh episodes one to six or at least one to five I have to read six this weekend so depending when I shoot my video um so there you have it that's my Friday reads till next time thanks very much <laughs>